I want you to think of the person that you know best. Someone you know so well that you might even say you know them better than they know themselves. How confident are you that your perception of this person is accurate? Let's say this person is replaced one day. Let's say that this replacement is a version of them created entirely from your own memories. Nothing more and nothing less. Is this subjectively the same person? Or is it someone else? Do you think you'd be able to tell the difference? If you couldn't tell the difference, then how important would it be for you to learn that this is merely a copy of the original who is now gone? If you could tell the difference, then does that mean that you remembered this person incorrectly? Let's go a step further. Let's say that as far as you can tell, this is the same person exactly the way you remember them. But they know they're not the original. They know that they're just your recollection of another person. And they accuse you of remembering them wrong. Of remembering them in a way that causes them pain. What would you say? What if you were the copy, predetermined to carry out a particular course of action just because someone you've objectively never met remembers you doing it? Now what? Hey everyone, welcome to The Common Hatred. Today, we're talking about Solaris. Now, in all likelihood, you've probably never even heard of this movie. Solaris was a poorly advertised and not particularly well-received box office failure, and I can't remember ever mentioning it to someone who could recall having heard of it before. Solaris is a 2002 science fiction movie that was written and directed by Steven Soderbergh, produced by James Cameron, and scored by Cliff Martinez. It stars George Clooney, Natasha McElhone, Viola Davis, and Jeremy Davies, with Ulrich Tukur in a supporting role. While sometimes called a remake of Andrei Tarkovsky's 1972 classic Solaris, which itself is an adaptation of the 1961 Stanislaw Lem novel also called Solaris, Soderbergh himself has said that he pulled inspiration for his 2002 edition from, quote, both the film and the book that it's based on. And in the end, I think it's too different from either to really be considered either a remake or a straight adaptation. Many of the negative reviews compare Solaris unfavorably to both the Tarkovsky original as well as to their shared source material, but Solaris the film is so different from Solaris the book or Solaris the movie that to directly compare them, to me, feels like apples and oranges. If you've never seen the Tarkovsky adaptation and you've never read the book, then you're at a good starting place. Solaris, in my mind, is a movie that's best experienced with as little outside information as possible. That was how I saw it. And while I can't say for sure whether my experience really would have been markedly different had I seen Solaris beforehand or read the original book, I can't help but think that I would have had a different, and less emotionally memorable experience. So if you've never seen Solaris, I would kindly ask you to go and do that now, then come back after you're done. As of the time of recording, if you have the Stars Channel subscription on Amazon Video, it's included there for free. If you're not already subscribed to the Stars Channel, you're not eligible for the 7 day free trial, and you're not the torrenting type, then you can usually find it on DVD for less than 5 bucks at any big DVD store which is convenient for you, but rests like a dagger in my heart. If you've already seen Solaris before and you loved it, I mean, you don't really need to be here, but you're more than welcome to stay. And if you've seen it before and didn't care for it, whether you'd seen it a long time ago or you just got back from watching it and now you're pissed that I told you to watch a movie you hated, then please stick around. Maybe I can't change your mind, but I'd certainly like to try. It's nice to meet you. My name is Doom, and Solaris is my favorite movie. Of course, I would be the kind of asshole who, when asked what their favorite movie's about, has to answer with, it's complicated. Solaris is a movie that's hard to really try explaining without spoiling the whole thing. We will be moving forward under the assumption that either you've watched it by now, or you've decided that you don't mind having the entire thing spoiled for you. Consider this your first and final spoiler warning. When I try to tell people what Solaris is about, what I say is that it's about love and the nature of our memories. This description immediately sets it very firmly apart from its source material, which author Stanislaw Lem has repeatedly said is about exploring what humans would do upon encountering a truly unknowable and ununderstandable alien force. Lem has been a vocal critic of Solaris adaptations for a very long time, always stating that the interpretations focus too much on the interpersonal relationships of the humans on the station and not enough on their reactions to and engagements with the celestial body that they're observing. About the Soderbergh adaptation, Lem said, quote, Some reviewers claim the film was a love story, a romance set in outer space. I have not seen the film, and I am not familiar with the script, hence I cannot say anything about the movie itself, except for what the reviews reflect. 
However, to my best knowledge, the book was not dedicated to erotic problems of people in outer space. He goes on to say, quote, Had Solaris dealt with love of a man for a woman, no matter whether on Earth or in space, it would not have been entitled Solaris. Indeed, in Solaris I attempted to present the problem of an encounter in space with a form of being that is neither human nor humanoid. All of this is fair criticism. The novel Solaris has people in it, yes. And those people interact with one another, yes. But it's a book less concerned with how people relate to each other than with how people deal with the unknown and the unknowable. It's a fascinating book, I recommend reading it after watching the movie. But Solaris as a film ends up taking so little from the novel that I'd argue it's more inspired by than adapted from. Though Lem himself might say that even that's being too charitable toward what is ultimately a very tenuous connection. To that end, I'd say that Solaris is based on Stanislaw Lem's original, to basically the same degree that Total Recall is based on We Can Remember It For You Wholesale by Philip K. Dick. I mean, it is, but, like, is it? Both are great, obviously, but Total Recall can hardly be called a faithful adaptation. Like Solaris, it's so removed from the source material that it's best considered to be inspired by instead of adapted from. They might share characters, themes, and so on, but sometimes in name only, and often from a totally different perspective than the one the author had. Stanislaw Lem was interested in telling a story about the unknown, and about how people might react to encountering that unknown, but the novel is ultimately unconcerned with the people themselves in terms of how they relate to one another. Steven Soderbergh was interested in telling a story that heavily involves the unknown, but his Solaris is ultimately about two people, and the relationship that exists between them. If you recently watched the movie, or you just don't think you need a refresher because you've seen it a lot of times, skip to this timestamp to go ahead and get to the analysis portion. If you do want a refresher of the events, or you've decided to just watch this video without ever having seen the movie, but you also don't care about getting spoiled, then settle in. Now normally on this channel, I'm not going to go through and do a 40 minute plot synopsis of every movie I talk about in the videos. There's literally no reason to do that. But with Solaris, I feel like this is a movie that few enough people have seen, and few enough people will be willing to now go watch before continuing with this video, that I'm sure for a lot of you this is the only way you're ever going to experience this movie. And if that's what it's come to, then well, at least a fan described it to you for the first time. I'm desperate for people to experience this movie somehow, and so I sort of feel like I have no other choice. You only get a pass this once though, you will have to watch all the other movies I ever talk about yourself. Solaris gets this treatment because it's special. Obviously this part is very long, but well we have a whole movie to go through. Okay, let's get started. On Earth, in the ambiguous near future, a clearly unhappy psychiatrist named Chris Kelvin goes through the motions of his life. We begin with him sitting on a bed while it rains outside. The first words we hear come from an unseen woman. Chris, what is it? I love you so much. Don't you love me anymore? While cutting vegetables, he cuts his finger and rinses the wound under the kitchen sink. He receives a visit from a company that sent an expedition to observe a faraway celestial body called Solaris. A good friend of his, Dr. Jabarian, was on this mission, and has sent Kelvin a message. I told the crew that your background and experiences made you the, the ideal candidate for this job. I, uh, I hope you will come to Solaris, Chris. I, I think you need to. I wish I could be more specific about all of this, but, uh, you know... The DBA reps say that they've already attempted to recover the crew by sending in a security force, but contact was lost as they approach Solaris and the force has not returned. Sending Kelvin is a last resort, but the only option they have left. Upon arrival, after following a blood trail, Kelvin discovers two bodies in a refrigerated room, one of which is Jabarian's. The other person, whoever they were, is implied to have come to a grisly end. We're shown some blood seeping from somewhere above the ceiling, but Kelvin doesn't see it. Of the original crew, only two remain on the ship. 
Dr. Snow, an eccentric and nervous man who serves as Kelvin's primary source of information, and Dr. Gordon, a frustrated and calculating woman who has stayed on the ship specifically because she wants to outsmart whatever is affecting the crew. There are two other crew members accounted for. First is Cotard, who is said to have attempted to flee in an escape pod when security forces showed up. They shot a hole in the pod. Presumably, he did not survive this. The other, Reese, is simply said to have disappeared. All they can determine is that he's no longer on the ship. Where he went and how is unknown. Jabarian is revealed to have killed himself. Snow found his body. Snow offers that Dr. Gordon is in her room, but will not let anyone inside. Kelvin asks Snow to tell him what's happening. He says, I could tell you what's happening, but... I don't know if that'd really tell you what's happening. He visits Gordon next, who makes him swear that he won't try to come in. She conspicuously doesn't fully open the door. He asks her why the crew hasn't returned to Earth, and what happened on the station, making it clear that if he's not successful in facilitating their return, DBA intends to abandon the ship and everyone on board. We hear clanging noises from inside Gordon's room, and she hastily ends their conversation and shuts the door. There are sounds of what may be a struggle, though they come to an abrupt end. Until it starts happening to you, there's really no point in discussing it. While exploring the ship after this, Kelvin sees and chases a child. The child seemingly disappears after Kelvin rounds a corner. He asks Snow about this, and is told the child is Jabarian's son Michael, who, obviously, was not part of the expedition. How is that possible? I think that's why you're here. Snow asks Calvin how long he thinks he can go without sleeping, and offers him some advice. When you do go to sleep, I find I sleep much better with the door locked. Calvin conducts a formal interview with Gordon. She was already attached to the mission as a physicist before NASA sold the project to DBA, and she was sent to assess the economic potential of Solaris as a viable commercial property, property or possible energy source. I was still compiling data when this shit started happening. She states that she tested the ship's supplies multiple times following the onset of events, but found no traces of contaminants or psychotropic compounds. When asked what she can say about what exactly is happening, she offers this response. Just that I want it to stop. But I want to stop it. If I can stop it, that means I'm smarter than it is. During Snow's interview, Calvin says that he can guarantee Snow and Gordon's safe return if they agree to go back to Earth. Snow replies that while he would kill to go back to Earth, Gordon, quote, happens to be Gordon, and presumably she won't leave until she's solved the problem to her satisfaction. Kelvin unpacks while listening to a recording left behind by Jabarian, pontificating about humanity's motives regarding space exploration. But when you think about it, our enthusiasm's a sham. We don't want other worlds. We want mirrors. He locks the door and goes to sleep on the most uncomfortable-looking bed of all time. We're shown alternating shots of a sleeping Kelvin and Solaris itself, each cut zooming in closer and closer. These cuts then switch between Solaris, Kelvin, and, we assume, Kelvin's dreams. He sees a woman on a train with whom he shares lingering eye contact. Later, he attends a party with Jabarian where the woman is in attendance. They talk about the then-upcoming Solaris mission, implying that Kelvin's dream is of his own memories. While Kelvin stares at the woman, distracted, Jabarian says that as we study Solaris, the most interesting thing is it, um, well, it, it seems to be reacting, almost like it knows it's being observed. I can't explain it. Seeing that Kelvin's not paying attention, Jabarian tells him to approach the woman. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, go to her. Her name is Rhea. She's a bit tricky, but um, I guess she's worthwhile. Rhea, clearly expecting him, opens with, Don't blow it. As she speaks, we realize that the unseen woman's voice we heard at the very beginning was Rhea. Kelvin resists his impulse to ask her about the doorknob she was holding on the train. She suggests he woo her with poetry. In response, he names the Dylan Thomas poem, And Death Shall Have No Dominion. It's not a very happy poem, though. Well, you didn't seem very happy when I saw you on the train. I wasn't. And tonight? It's early. 
They go home together. Kelvin, back on the ship, opens his eyes and sees a blurry figure in the room. It approaches and sits in front of him, slowly coming into focus as Rhea. They kiss. Back in Kelvin's apartment, they also kiss. Back on the ship, they do the do. In Kelvin's apartment, they also do the do. We return to Kelvin, seemingly unmoved during his sleep. Were the erotic problems of people in outer space that we just saw a moment ago a dream within a dream? Maybe, but Kelvin is awoken by a hand stroking his neck. Rhea is here. He shoots awake and runs across the room, loudly slapping himself to ensure that he's not dreaming. Turning back to see that Rhea has not disappeared, he is visibly affected by her presence. He asks Rhea whether he's awake. She says yes. He asks how she could be here, but she seems confused by the question, answering, How do you mean? He asks her where she thinks she is, and she answers, At home? Kelvin asks, Where is home? To which she responds with the generic, With you, where we live. He asks whether she remembers being together with him anywhere else, and she references their apartment. Kelvin says to describe it. It's dark. It's very, very dark. There are no paintings on the wall. No pictures anywhere. No pictures on the fridge, even, which I always thought was a bit strange. Kelvin asks whether she remembers where they first saw each other. Rhea smiles and answers, on a train. He does not seem calmed by her responses. As if surprised to say so, Rhea says she's so happy to see him. Then, in a very familiar cadence, I love you so much. I love you so much. But don't you love me anymore? Kelvin moves to leave, saying he has to check something out with the crew. Rhea's calm for a moment, then suddenly panics and begs him not to leave her. She doesn't seem to understand why she had that reaction. <sighs> why? I don't know. He tricks Rhea into entering one of the remaining escape pods and sends her away into space. He's less than thrilled by the experience. He turns away, unable to watch what he's done. Snow, presumably aware that Kelvin has now experienced what's happening to the rest of them, comes to visit Kelvin in his room. He asks what that was. Snow responds that they're still working on that. He asks who and where Snow's visitor is. Snow says it was his brother, but that it had stopped appearing. Kelvin says that his visitor was his wife. Snow asks whether this wife is dead. Kelvin doesn't answer, but Snow infers that this means yes. He asks what her name was, but instead of answering, Kelvin asks whether the visitor rail will come back. Do you want her to? The next night, Kelvin has piled things in front of his door. The door slides, so it wouldn't knock anything over, but the ruckus from someone attempting to move or step over them to enter the room would, presumably, wake him up. He again goes to sleep. Before we return to his dreamt memories, we again see Solaris. We're shown a montage of Kelvin and Rhea talking about getting married. She's clearly apprehensive about it, but just as clearly not apprehensive about their relationship in general. Eventually she agrees, though she asks whether they'd have to invite anyone. Kelvin says there should be witnesses, otherwise nobody would believe them. He buys a book of Dylan Thomas poems while they're out together. She tells him a story about an imaginary friend she had as a child, and about how her mother was certifiably insane. We fade back to Solaris, then to Kelvin's room. Rhea again wakes him up. This time, he seems resigned to her reappearance. Based on how he's shirtless after the cut immediately following, off-screen he has again slept with this new visitor, Rhea, this time deliberately. She plays with his hands and sees the scar on his finger from the cut he got before he left Earth, and asks when it happened because she doesn't remember it. He says he got it right before he came to Solaris, and in response to her asking whether she was with him at the time, says no. Rhea rolls over and says that she doesn't actually remember anything, other than Kelvin himself, and inquires as to whether she's been sick. He evasively responds, sort of. She asks whether they've been apart, and he says that they have, for a few years now, and that he was alone during that time. Was that difficult? Did you think about me? Yes. Rhea, staring out a window at Solaris, asks what it is. When told that it's Solaris, she responds kind of strangely. Oh my god, yes. She says she can't remember how she got here, and asks whether she came with Kelvin. He says he doesn't know how she got here. He woke up and she was just here. She infers from this that she wasn't here yesterday, implying that either this is a different visitor Rhea from before, 
or she simply doesn't remember the previous day's visit and then being sent away. Kelvin confirms that she was not present the day before, and does not tell her about the previous visitor. Later, Kelvin is moved to his desk and is doing something on his computer. Rhea, seemingly ill at ease, stares out at Solaris as a memory comes to her. Rhea, on Earth, in a pharmacy buying a pregnancy test. The test is positive, clearly not a result she's happy with. Kelvin asks whether she's coming with him to a group dinner, and says that if she doesn't come, people will notice. He continues that he can put up with her many difficulties, her restlessness, her mood swings, her changing jobs every three months, but that he can't put up with her hiding from him. Why do you do that? Do you want to be here? Because I need help. I can't do this. I can't continue to do this on my own. She goes to the dinner where the table's discussing God and religion. Rhea, clearly feeling talked down to about her differing opinion, excuses herself and goes home alone. When Kelvin returns home and asks her where she's been, she responds, Away from those fucking people. They're my friends. Yeah. On the ship, Ray is clearly becoming distressed by these memories. She tells Kelvin that she has to talk to him, that she doesn't understand what's happening, and that if she does understand what's happening, then she doesn't think she can live with it. He asks what she means. She explains that she's not the person she remembers. I mean, I, I do remember things, but... I don't remember being there. I don't remember experiencing those things. She says she's trying to understand, but strange things keep coming into her head, she doesn't know where they're coming from, and she's scared. As she speaks, Calvin retrieves a bottle of blue pills and brings her one along with some water. When he says that he thinks she needs to rest and gives her the pill to take, she becomes frustrated. Because I don't think that I can live with this. I don't understand what is happening now. This, 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 I remember this. I have a memory of it. But I don't, I don't remember seeing it. I don't, I don't remember being there. Somewhat resigned, she takes the pill anyway, while Kelvin assures her that her distress is brought on by stress and fatigue. He asks her to stay here while he talks to Gordon and Snow so they can all go back to Earth. She seems annoyed with him, but lets him go without panicking this time. He confers with Snow, who says he was worried about Kelvin, especially after he sent the first visitor, Rhea, away. Kelvin sternly tells Snow that the new visitor, Rhea, can never know about that, and Snow swears not to tell. Snow rhetorically asks whether the visitors can get pregnant. Meanwhile, Visitor Rhea is staring out at Solaris and remembering a fight she had with Kelvin. She's had an abortion, and Kelvin is furious. He angrily packs a bag while they fight. She tearily explains that she obviously could not have a child, and that Kelvin already knew that about her, so she doesn't understand why he's reacting the way he is. Why would I want a child? Why would I want anything that would bring life into this house? She begs him not to leave, but he storms out. Stop it. Please, because I won't make it without you. Then you won't make it. Let go no. of me! Snow believes that the best way to convince Gordon to come back with them to Earth would be to have a meeting with her and Rhea. Because, uh, <laughs> well... Because I'm thinking women, right? Women, you know? Together on the same team and all that shit. What happens? You know what happens. Good shit, you know? Mysterious, but good. Usually very good. Things get solved. <laughs> Which, I mean, I guess I don't think he's wrong, but I'm not so sure that in this particular instance that's really the best plan. Visitor Rhea continues to remember things. Backed by the sound of George Clooney reciting the first stanza of And Death Shall Have No Dominion, after Kelvin is stormed out, Rhea calmly opens a drawer and retrieves a bottle of the same blue pills Visitor Rhea has just taken. Rhea goes to the bathroom and smashes the bottle open against the faucet, scoops them out of the sink, and swallows them all. She retrieves the book of Dylan Thomas poems that they'd purchased in the previous memory. Kelvin re-enters the room where Visitor Rhea is, still staring out at Solaris. He sits down on the bed behind her. We see Rhea's hand in bed, a page torn from the book clutched in her hand. You found me. I came back for you. I came back that day. I'm sorry. The meeting Snow had suggested is happening. Gordon asks Snow to guess whether the visitors are made of subatomic particles. He says probably. He supposes that they're likely stabilized by Higgs field. Gordon suggests that maybe if they were to create a negative Higgs field and shoot it at a visitor, they would disintegrate and stop returning. It would take a lot of power, they'd have to shut down all non-critical ship functions and it may not even work, but Gordon wants to try it anyway. Kelvin vetoes the idea and says they'll take their findings back to Earth. 
Gordon is incredulous at this, hypothesizing that without dealing with it, the visitor phenomenon may very well follow them back, causing what's happening on the station to happen on Earth on a mass scale. She believes that assuming the phenomenon is benign would be a huge mistake, suggesting that Solaris is trying to drive the crew mad just to watch them kill each other. Kelvin notes that, considering Solaris's resources, it could have destroyed them already if that was its goal. Gordon ignores him and tells Snow to meet her in the lab in an hour. Kelvin says he won't let them create and use the device. Gordon asks how he plans to stop her, so Kelvin asks how she plans to stop him from taking his visitor, Rhea, back to Earth. Gordon retaliates by revealing that he sent the first visitor away. Snow wonders whether her oxygen's run out by now. Gordon wonders whether they need oxygen at all. Rhea asks Kelvin what they're talking about, and reluctantly he explains. We came before. We got rid of you. What? I sent you away. Into space. Oh my god. Oh my god. What have you done, Captain? Rhea, I didn't understand. Despondent, Rhea runs out of the room. Kelvin asks Gordon why she felt the need to do that. She says that becoming emotionally involved with a visitor is a mistake. You're being manipulated. If she were ugly, you wouldn't want her around. That's why she's not ugly. She's a mirror that reflects part of your mind. You provide the formula. Kelvin counters that she is nonetheless alive, but Gordon raises her voice and reminds him that whatever she is, she's not human. Kelvin asks who her visitor is, if she's so ready to destroy it without hesitation. Who is it? What is it? Does it feel? Can it touch? Does it speak? Gordon brushes these concerns aside and tells him that she feels they are now in a situation beyond morality. Kelvin's wife is dead. Kelvin asks how she can be so sure about something she doesn't understand, but Gordon insists that this visitor is merely a copy. Copy. A facsimile, and she's seducing you all over again. You're sick. We are not taking her back with us. Later, after we see Rhea sobbing in Kelvin's bed, he wakes up to see another blurry, shadowy figure sitting in front of him. He moves to turn the light on, but the figure, who we can tell from the voice as Jabarian, tells him to leave it off. They speak quietly, Rhea sleeping next to him. Jabarian notes that Kelvin thinks he's dreaming him. In direct contrast to Kelvin's assertions only moments ago that this Rhea is his Rhea, he immediately says that this person is not Jabarian. He's just a puppet. And you're not. Well, maybe you're my puppet. But like all puppets, you think you're actually human. Asked why he committed suicide, Jabarian says that it seemed like a good idea at the time. Now I think I made a mistake. Kelvin asks about the boy on the station, Jabarian's son, Michael. And that's not my son. My son is on Earth. And that's not your wife. They are part of Solaris. Remember that. Kelvin asks what Solaris wants from them, and Jabarian huffs and tells Kelvin that questions like that are exactly why he has to go back to Earth. This is why you have to leave. If you keep thinking there's a solution, you'll die here. There are no answers. Only choices. Kelvin then wakes up again, but this time Ray is no longer there. He gets up to look for her. A metallic clattering noise alerts him, and he runs toward it. He finds her on the ground, next to a sizzling green fluid. Upon rolling her over, we can see that this material has burned through her mouth and throat. She's dead. He yells for Gordon and carries Rhea's body back to his room. Gordon is informed that Rhea drank liquid oxygen. Kelvin checks for a pulse and says that she's dead. Gordon says she isn't, just as Rhea begins to convulse and her wound begins to heal. Looking on in disgust, Gordon says that she never gets used to these resurrections and leaves. Snow, clearly uncomfortable, slowly backs out of the room. Visitor Rhea is distressed at having been brought back to life. She pushes Kelvin away and tells him not to call her Rhea. The lights flicker several times, indicating that Gordon has used the Higgs device. She explains how it works and says that she used it on her visitor. It disappeared and has not returned. She tells Kelvin that this is clearly what Visitor Rhea wants. Leaving, Kelvin retorts that he won't let her even ask to be vaporized, and that he'll stay awake to prevent her from going to Gordon while he's asleep. Back in his room, Rhea protests that the entire problem is she, being created entirely from Kelvin's memories, is not a whole person. So even if you remember something wrong, I am predetermined to carry it out. I'm suicidal because that's how you remember me. My voice sounds the way it does because that's how you remember it. Kelvin argues that he doesn't believe they're predetermined to relive their past, instead now being able to choose things differently. The day I left and you said that you wouldn't make it, I didn't hear you because I was angry. This is my chance to undo that mistake, and I need you to help me. But am I really Rhea? I don't know anymore. All 
I see with you. Rhea is not comforted by this answer. Rhea says that while she has no way to communicate with Solaris, it must still be able to hear her and know what she's going through. That if she and Kelvin tried to make a life together, they would have to have an unspoken understanding that she isn't human. Kelvin takes some red pills. If blues are downers, then obviously these are uppers. Rhea begs Kelvin to let Gordon use the Higgs device on her so that he can go back to Earth and report the crew's findings. He says no. She tells him that they could never have any kind of life on Earth, and asks what kind of life they could possibly have together on the ship, just trapped indefinitely. Kelvin says that it's all they have. It's enough for him. She begs him to get some rest. He's then shown shirtless in bed, either asleep or resting, while Rhea whispers with Gordon in the hallway, telling her that it's not murder, you said that yourself. You're the one who put the idea in my mind in the first place. Chris doesn't trust me anymore. He won't even let me leave the room. Kelvin, awake but quite weak and very sweaty, reaches for his now nearly empty bottle and takes a few more uppers. How much time has passed during this sequence is ambiguous, but considering how few pills are left, it's presumably been at least a few days. The inner layer of the door, which is locked, has been ripped up, and there's blood surrounding the damage. He looks ahead and, hallucinating, sees Rhea staring at him on the train, then in their apartment, then on the street, then on the ship. The camera pans and visitor Rhea, kneeling just outside the doorway, is seen speaking with the visitor of Jabarian's son. The camera pans some more, and now she's sitting next to Kelvin, smiling at him. With great struggle, he sits up and very slowly leaves the room. Back on Earth, Kelvin returns home after their fight over Ray's abortion. He's puzzled to find her in bed, but quickly guesses what she's done. He tests her body temperature and finds that it's cold. He pries the paper from her hand. It's the page from the Dylan Thomas book with And Death Shall Have No Dominion printed on it. Back in bed again, Kelvin wakes and slowly looks over. His monitor has a recording of Rhea queued up. Rhea tells him not to blame Gordon for her disappearance. She begged Gordon to use the device on her, and things are better this way. She says that she went through his possessions and found the suicide note, the page torn from the book of poems. And I realized I'm not her. I'm not Rhea. I know you loved me, though. I know that. I felt that. And I love you. I wish we could just live inside that feeling forever. Maybe there's a place where we can, but I know it's not on Earth, and it's not on this ship. That's all I can say right now. Kelvin angrily confronts Gordon outside the refrigerated room, where she's locked the door so no one can stop her from turning the station's AI back online so she can go home. He shouts that she murdered Rhea, but Gordon shouts back that whatever the visitors were, they weren't human, and she felt threatened by that. It's not human, and I'm threatened by that! And I want to win. I want humans to win. Whose side are you on? Kelvin now sees the bloodstain on the ceiling from before. They open the slats, and find Dr. Snow. Gordon angrily says that she knew it. He asks how long she thinks Snow's been dead. She says it would be hard to tell because of the cold. They confront Snow. He says the real Dr. Snow attacked him as soon as he appeared, and he instinctively fought back in self-defense, killing the real Snow in the process. I survived the first 30 seconds of this life by killing someone. Killing someone who happens to be me. Gordon immediately suggests that they use the Higgs device on him, but Snow says that they probably don't have time. Since the first use of the Higgs device, Solaris has been taking on mass exponentially, pulling in everything within its gravitational field. The Higgs device also drained the fuel cell reactors, leaving the station now unable to pull away from Solaris' gravitational pull. He suggests that they just lock him in this room and take the station's attached shuttle back. Gordon runs out while Kelvin locks the door from the outside. The two suit up. As Gordon enters the shuttle, we see that Solaris, previously a blue-violet color, has now taken on a red-orange hue. While Gordon runs through the pre-flight checklist, Kelvin pauses outside the shuttle and stares out at Solaris. Earth. It's raining again. Like in the beginning, Kelvin sits alone on his bed. He again goes through the motions of his life. He says he's been gone so long that even the word Earth sounds strange to him now. He's not even sure how long he'd been gone or how long he's been back, nor does he know whether it even matters. Over time, he makes a conscious effort to smile Nod. Stand. I studied these gestures until they became reflexes again. But I was haunted by the idea that I remembered her wrong. Somehow I was wrong about everything. Exactly as he'd been doing on the day that the DBA officers came to visit, Kelvin removed some vegetables from his fridge. Except this time, where before the fridge door was bare, it now has a framed photo of Rhea. He again cuts his finger and again runs it under the tap except this time there is neither a wound nor a scar. 
Kelvin is puzzled. He looks over at his photo of Rhea. Back on the station. Kelvin is still staring out at Solaris while Gordon runs through the pre-flight checks. He backs up and seals the hatch, slowly removing and storing his helmet. The station's power starts to flicker as Solaris closes in, and Gordon leaves without him. As the wispy outer layers of Solaris begin to engulf the station, Kelvin wanders the halls shouting Rhea's name. The sound of the station being swallowed up is unbearable, and Kelvin collapses against a wall, screaming. Snow, in his room, stares straight up. Enraptured and almost joyful, he laughs as the station's power continues to fail around him. Kelvin, collapsed on the floor, sees Michael standing near him. The child reaches out his hand. Slowly, Kelvin reaches up and grasps it. In his kitchen, still staring at the photo, Kelvin hears Rhea say his name. Just like before, he steals himself before slowly turning around. We don't have to think like that anymore. We're together now. Everything we've done is forgiven. Everything. And that's Solaris. So let's talk. So before I get into this, I just have to say, when I bring up Solaris, including at the end of the Anthem video, I always mention it as a movie that nobody liked but me. Obviously this isn't actually true, there's no shortage of positive reviews from viewers if you go looking for them. But I have to give a special shout out to my older sister, who actually showed Solaris to me not long after she'd seen it for the first time when I was in the 8th grade. It's been my favorite movie since that night, and as far as I know it's still her favorite movie too. We often don't like the same things, but when it comes to movies, even when we don't like the same movies overall, she does tend to be an accurate judge of whether I would like a movie or not. I've shown Solaris to a few people over the years, and while some of those people even enjoyed it, I've never met someone who loves this movie as much as my sister and me. Consider this my attempt to rectify that, but even if it fails, I have to thank her for showing it to me in the first place. It obviously made an impression. With a movie like Solaris, obviously there's no single, objectively true interpretation unless you're Steven Soderbergh, who wrote the damn thing and thus presumably has all the answers that we're looking for. For the rest of us, this is a film that deliberately leaves many important things up to your own interpretation, which, whether by design or not, is an accurate reflection of how the film itself looks at memories. While I'll tell you what I think, you might take something entirely different from Solaris, and in fact I actually encourage you to come to your own conclusions. Okay, so what do I think happened in Solaris, and what do I think the movie's trying to say? First, what is Solaris, and what is Visitor Rhea? There are a few things that we can discount automatically. Unless you're arguing that Solaris is literally God, and the things that Kelvin goes through are some kind of test for redemption, then we can safely do away with any arguments that paint Visitor Rhea as the actual Rhea. Rhea, the Rhea from Earth that Kelvin was married to, is dead. Gordon is right. Whatever these visitors are, they're not human. They're copies. The most obvious examples of this come from Michael and Snow. Visitor Michael is present on the ship, and while we never see the human Michael back on Earth, we have no reason to believe that he's died. According to Visitor Snow, both he and the real Snow existed at the same time, however briefly, until Visitor Snow killed the original. The existence of both an original and a copy make moot the question of which is the original. The one that came first is the original, obviously. So there's no reason to entertain the usual philosophical questions about whether the visitors are the same people as the originals they're copying. For me, the question isn't whether Visitor Rhea is really Rhea. It's clear that she's not. The question for me is whether, as far as Kelvin's own lived experience goes, the distinction between these two actually matters. The first time Kelvin encounters his visitor, rather than deal with it, he chooses to send her off into space. Considering he believes Visitor Rhea number 2 is dead when he discovers her after she drank the liquid oxygen, then we can infer that he believed sending Visitor Rhea number one into space would result, eventually, in her death. When Solaris makes another Rhea after this, Kelvin has apparently already decided that he'll keep her around this time. Despite his passionate defense of Visitor Rhea's personhood to Gordon, he's just as quick to immediately call the Jabarian he speaks with, who he assumes is another visitor. Not a person, but a puppet. The visitors are people when the argument suits him. He loved his wife, and he desperately wants a second chance to be with her, 
but he was quick to send the first visitor away to her assumed death, and while he was upset by it, he was also fully prepared to never speak of it again. After Gordon used the Higgs device on visitor Rhea number two, and she disappeared permanently, Kelvin accused her of murder. Does he, then, consider himself a murderer? Probably not. He likely hasn't even considered the possibility. His determination to believe that Visitor Rhea is his wife leaves him in a position where he'll ignore evidence to the contrary and refuse to think about events that make his actions questionable. This is just cognitive dissonance in action. The passage of time once Kelvin arrives on the station is kind of ambiguous. His first Visitor Rhea comes after his first sleep. The second comes the night after. But beyond that, it's really hard to be sure how much time passes for the rest of the film. It's enough time for Kelvin to no longer be able to separate the Rhea of his memories from the Rhea on the ship. But considering she's literally created from his memories, and he's looking for any reason to believe that she's his wife, that doesn't actually tell us very much. So who is Visitor Rhea? If she's created from Kelvin's memories, then why do we see her remembering things that happened when Kelvin wasn't there? There are a few different ways to look at this depending on what you think is happening, but here's my read on it. Solaris itself has no motives, or at least none that we can understand. It doesn't want anything beyond, maybe, to observe, assuming it's even doing that. Is the creation of visitors a deliberate act, or an instinct? We have no way to know, and considering it has, or at least uses, no direct line of communication between itself and the people on the station, the distinction honestly is pretty meaningless either way. The visitors themselves seem just as confused by Solaris as the crew, so clearly it isn't communicating with them either. Visitor Rhea, being created entirely from Kelvin's memories, behaves irrationally because he remembers her as behaving irrationally. When he asks her to stay behind so he can speak with the crew, a panic is triggered that seems to take even her by surprise. Rhea, currently nowhere near comprehending the circumstances of her creation, doesn't understand why this emotion suddenly showed up out of nowhere. Kelvin also doesn't understand why she panicked, because he doesn't think that he remembers Rhea as someone who panics when he leaves. But he does. Here is when we come to the crux of Solaris. The subjectivity of your memories. By their very nature, your memories of people are often wrong or distorted, sometimes through no fault of your own. If you're close with somebody that you see and speak with every day, then your memory of them is constantly updated and could thus be said to be fairly accurate, at least as far as you know. Of course, it is entirely possible that the version of themselves that they show you is deliberately incorrect in some way. Obviously, the most honest and real version of you is the version that only you actually know about. As more and more time passes from when you last saw or spoke with somebody, then your memory of them, by necessity, becomes inaccurate. They change and they grow, and until you see them again, you have no way to update your memory to reflect this new, most accurate version. If you're in a relationship that ends, and you have no contact with that person for an extended period of time, then eventually the person you knew and loved effectively no longer exists outside of your memories. But what if that person died? They have no opportunities to grow and change beyond your final perception of them, so in theory a copy would objectively appear to be the same person. But given enough time, it's possible that your memory wouldn't be as accurate as it used to be. You might find yourself focusing on particular aspects of their personality, deliberately or not, that eventually morph that person into being somebody else. When Rhea's staring out at Solaris and perusing her memories, we see her remembering things that Rhea did by herself. Buying a pregnancy test, looking at the results of the pregnancy test, smashing the bottle, taking all the pills, and preparing to die. But this Rhea is made from Kelvin's memories, and Kelvin wasn't there for those events. My interpretation of this is that this is how Kelvin assumed these things happened, and he seamlessly incorporated those assumptions into his memories of her. We see a lot of happy memories with Rhea, where she's acting normal and their relationship seems nice. Then we see her struggling, and their relationship struggling, ending with her taking her own life. It doesn't seem unreasonable to assume that considering the state we find him in when the film opens, Kelvin spends more of his time dwelling on the bad times than on the good. It's not the good times that keep you up at night, after all. He obviously regrets having left on the day Rhea died. He apologizes and tells her that it was a mistake, one that he believes he's now being given a chance to undo. Considering how immediately Kelvin chooses to believe that this is Rhea, and how determined he is to convince both himself and Gordon that this Rhea is his Rhea, it's probably safe to say that Kelvin obsesses over the final few days or weeks of their relationship, further and further minimizing their salad days until the end is nearly all that's left. 
We can't be sure exactly how long it's been since visitor Rhea number two showed up before her distress begins, but it seems to be less than a day. She arrives, and she's very happy to see Kelvin, but it doesn't take long before she makes a vaguely suicidal statement, then a more fervent and clear suicidal statement, and then, not too soon after, she makes a technically successful suicide attempt. This very short honeymoon period reflects how little happiness is left in Kelvin's memory of his relationship with Rhea. Grief transforms your memories. I'm certainly not blaming him for being unable to focus on the happier parts of their relationship when things ended the way that they did. But when the only Rhea he has left is the one he remembers, then considering the things he focuses on, does he really still have her at all? It's often said that when people die, they live on in the memories of the people who remember them. Is that still true if they don't remember you correctly? When Visitor Rhea starts behaving irrationally, Kelvin doesn't seem to understand why. Once she's made aware of how she was created, she outright tells him that she behaves the way she does because that's how he remembers her behaving. I'm suicidal because that's how you remember me. My voice sounds the way it does because that's how you remember it. She's not a whole person. Solaris as an entity shows such an absence of conscious intent that to speculate on its motives feels a lot like shouting into the void. Actions speak louder than words, sure, but we only have one action to speculate on. The creation of human simulacra based on the memories of the crew. The crew speculates on its motives, but they know just as much, or rather, just as little as we do, and their conclusions are just as arbitrary and varied as any of ours. In my reading, personally, I take the Jabarian apparition's words as the honest truth, regardless of whether it was sent by Solaris itself to speak to Kelvin, or it was instead just born from his own subconscious trying to speak to him in a dream. Solaris, whatever it's doing, wants nothing at all. It creates these copies either reflexively, as unintentionally as you and I breathe in and out, or unwillingly and unwittingly, the same way our hearts pump blood and our livers filter toxins regardless of our feelings on the matter. But either way, the creation of these copies is not a deliberate act that has intended results. It's something that happens without being directed to, and Solaris performs the act as impartially as a heart monitor might tell you your BPM. If you interpreted this BPM reading as a judgment, as something done specifically because it wanted you to do something about it, and you were left to discover and act upon this implied but unexplained motive in an attempt to please or appease your heart monitor, well, you would go to your grave still trying to achieve that. This is why you have to leave. If you keep thinking there's a solution, you'll die here. So Visitor Rhea, even though Kelvin interprets her presence alternately as either a test or a gift, is intended to be neither. She's not intended to be anything at all, she simply is. And the fact that she functions as evidence that Kelvin worries he misremembers his late wife is a burden he places upon himself. The original Soderbergh screenplay, which admittedly is very different in several ways from the final product, makes this idea even clearer in Kelvin's final monologue. I'm haunted by the idea that I remembered her wrong. That I shaded my memory of her to suit myself. That I was unfair to her and caused her destruction. What if I was wrong about everything? I've come to believe that memory is a curse. Visitor Rhea has free will to a point, but because Kelvin's memories doom her into a cycle of suicidal behavior, she ends up trapped in a spiral of his own making that can only end the way he remembers Rhea's life ending. Deliberately, permanently, and in a manner that leaves him blaming himself. Don't you see? I came from your memory of her. That's the problem. I'm not a whole person. This is the key difference that separates Visitor Rhea from real human beings. Free will. While she can exercise a certain amount of free will, in the end she's condemned to suffer suicidal urges because Kelvin remembers Rhea as suffering from suicidal urges. She can never get better, because Kelvin doesn't remember Rhea ever getting better. Knowing that she's damned to suffer endlessly causes her to want to take her own life, which is what the original Rhea did, which is what causes Visitor Rhea to be trapped in this very cycle. She has no escape. Ironically, the only way for her to escape this cycle is to convince Gordon to use the Higgs device on her. An assisted suicide. But while the original Rhea's death came from a place of despair, Visitor Rhea's seems, primarily, to come from a place of sympathy. She wants to end her suffering, yes, obviously, but the message she leaves Kelvin makes it clear that at least part of her motivation was to free him from his self-inflicted need to stay here on the station and try to make their relationship work, which would have done little more than condemn them both to a lifetime of suffering. Visitor Rhea comes to terms with her origins, and to spare Kelvin the struggle of having to decide how to live with what he's caused her to be, she removes herself from the equation. For her, 
this is what qualifies as a happy ending. Oblivion. The same conclusion Rhea came to, but born of different origins, and, to me, decidedly less bleak. It's a fulfillment of her determined end, but in a way that allows for one final exercise of what, for a copy, passes for free will. Second, what happened at the end? So at the end of the movie, Kelvin goes back to Earth, but is forever haunted by his experiences on the station. He spends the rest of his life worrying that he had remembered Rhea wrong, and by extension, was somehow wrong about everything. Except he didn't go back to Earth. He's still on the station, standing behind Gordon doing the pre-flight checks. Then he turns back to stay on the station, and Gordon leaves without him. I see this moment as basically an imagined spot. Faced with the point of no return, Kelvin considers what his life would be like if he went back, and concludes that he doesn't want to go. He finds himself with two options. Option A, return to Earth and live out his life forever worrying that he did the wrong thing. Option B, stay on the station, almost surely dying very shortly, in a final and probably futile attempt to receive the redemption that he felt was just within reach. What's left for him on Earth? His best and closest friend was Javarian, who's dead. After the death of his wife, he had, by all appearances, completely isolated himself. He had his job, which he seemed to despise, and spent the rest of his time alone. On the station, he has at least a minuscule chance at some abstract form of redemption, and even if he fails to achieve it, very soon it won't matter anymore, because he'll be dead. For Kelvin, the conclusion is basically that if he fails to achieve the redemption he seeks, then this is the happiest possible alternative. Oblivion Solaris swallows the station. Visitor Michael appears to Kelvin and offers his hand. Kelvin takes it, and we go into the final scene. Some version of Rhea is there, alive, and Kelvin tearfully asks whether he's alive or dead. Rhea responds, We don't have to think like that anymore. We're together now. They kiss. Fade to Solaris. Fade to title card. I think that Solaris, up until now an impartial and uninvolved entity observing the actions of beings several orders of magnitude below its own advanced understanding, has decided to get involved. Seeing Kelvin decide to stay and die rather than leave and live on, Solaris offers him something. If you really believe that this is what you want, then take my hand and accept whatever I decide to do with you, or die here in space never knowing what could have been. Kelvin takes the hand and accepts the deal. And then, basically, he dies. In Visitor Rhea's final message, she says, I know you loved me, though, and I love you. I wish we could just live inside that feeling forever. Maybe there's a place where we can, but I know it's not on Earth, and it's not on this ship. Honestly, that's what I believe happened. Solaris, for reasons unknown, has granted them the opportunity to live inside that feeling forever. Just the two of them, alone, eternally, or at least until Solaris itself ceases to be as the body burns out and dies, living within the feeling of being in love. It's not a happy ending, not quite. Rhea, the real Rhea, is still dead. Kelvin still remembered her in a way that objectively does a disservice to the real woman who died alone in an empty apartment after an argument with her husband. But all things considered, here at the very end of the path his life took, considering the decisions he made along the way, Kelvin receives what is his happiest possible ending. Love. Third. Miscellaneous other questions. I've focused on Rhea and Kelvin for this video, naturally, but I think there's quite a lot more to touch on here that I'm not even getting into, because I want you to puzzle these things over for yourself. I know what I think the answers to these questions are, but I'm interested in what you think. If the visitors are made from the memories of the crew, then why is Snow's visitor a copy of himself? His visitor killed him immediately in self-defense, so we'll never know the extent to which the copy could have replicated the original. We don't know how long the crew had to get to know each other before the visitor started appearing, so whether the others being fooled by Visitor Snow is an accurate reflection of its convincingness is hard to say. Visitor Snow tells Kelvin that his visitor was his brother. If we take this to not be a lie, then the assumption is that Snow had a twin brother, the twin brother appeared as a visitor, and then that visitor just took on Snow's identity after killing him. Who was Gordon's visitor? How long did it take for her to decide that they were not human, and thus that they deserved to die? It can easily be assumed that she kills her visitor over and over, and presumably attempts to keep them restrained either way. 
I think restraining them would be difficult. The film never outright shows this, just implying it with the shot of the door ripped apart near the end, but the book makes it clear that the visitors are inhumanly strong and can tear through the walls with their bare hands. If Gordon is killing her visitor over and over, has she found a way to restrain them that they're unable to escape, or are they just not resisting? Theoretically, it would be trivial for this visitor to fight back and kill her. Do they refuse to, or are they just prevented from doing so? When Gordon makes the Higgs device, she's quick to use it on her visitor as soon as possible, and shows no adverse psychological consequences after doing so. Even though she tells Kelvin that Visitor Rhea wants the device to be used on her, and that she's more than ready to make that happen, it's implied that she actually has some qualms about doing this, and has to be reassured by Visitor Rhea that it's not murder. She insists on calling Visitor Rhea it rather than she to reinforce her understanding that the visitors aren't humans, but she just as quickly reverts to using she-her pronouns in the sentences around this insistence. When Kelvin accuses Gordon of murder, Gordon makes sure to tell him that she didn't suffer in the end, as the disintegration was instantaneous. While we could easily assume that she disintegrated her own visitor with no preamble or forewarning, the shots were shown of the device during Visitor Rhea's recording clearly imply that she was given a much more dignified end. She was given time to record a final statement, and she was lying down, with the device pointed at her. Regardless of whether Gordon suggested she lie down or not, there's a kindness in either asking or allowing that Gordon clearly had no intentions of ever showing her own visitor. What is it about Visitor Rhea that made Gordon offer this kindness, seemingly against her own instincts? What will Gordon tell people about Solaris once she is returned to Earth? And, most importantly, where the fuck did Reese go? Fourth, what is this movie about? Well, the easy answer is that it's not really about anything or trying to say anything. It presents a story without a moral, and what you take from it is what you take from it, and then you move on to the next piece of media. The film, like Solaris itself, offers no real answers. It doesn't want anything from you. I find this interpretation attractive, because I like being left to draw my own conclusions when a piece of media has earned that kind of deliberate vagueness. Sometimes in media, things are just vague for the sake of being vague, which is lazy storytelling, but a story about an entity whose motives are either unknown or unknowable has earned the right to itself have no clear motive. Those expecting concrete explanations about the how and why certain things happen won't get them, for the hows and whys are secondary to the emotions being conveyed, and it's a credit to the work of Soderbergh and Clooney that so much is said with literally so little. I understand that this might not be a satisfying conclusion. Unfortunately, you might find my other conclusion to be even less satisfying, but I said it at the very beginning. This is a movie about love and the nature of memories. Love, objectively, is not rational. It makes people behave irrationally, it causes levels of emotion that can seem unbearable to sustain, and it's often argued that to love people who have died offers no useful evolutionary advantage. Loving something or someone is no guarantee of happiness. Loving someone doesn't mean that they love you. But we love all the same, knowing its highs and its lows, knowing that it comes with baggage that might burden you for the rest of your life. We love people who love us back. We love people who don't love us back. We love creatures whose capacity to understand our affection for them is not fully understood or agreed upon. And, yes, we love people who have died. Because we remember them. But as we've already discussed, memories are unreliable. Evolutionary advantages or disadvantages aside, we don't quite love the dead. We love our memories of them. It's not only possible, but in fact likely, that people who still feel love for someone who has passed all have different memories of that person. Sometimes slightly different, sometimes very different. I don't doubt that my mother loves the version of me that she knows, but that person, by necessity, is a completely different human being than the version of me that my oldest friend knows. When I die, both of these people might remember me and miss me, but they're remembering two completely different people who, at the end of the day, just had a few things in common. Which of these recollections is true and accurate? Both? Neither? Who's to say? I know what I think, but I'll be dead, so what I think won't really matter, will it? I'll live on only in the memories of the people who outlived me. Which, as Solaris demonstrates, is kind of the whole problem. I don't think Solaris comes to any kind of solid thesis statement-led conclusions, but I also don't think that it aspired to. Despite everything that's happening around them, in the end this is just a story about two people in love and about what they do about that feeling. It tells that story in a way that really resonated with me. It made me look inwards and think about the themes it presented and what they meant to me. In the end, all I can do is hope that it did the same for you. Solaris might not be your favorite movie, but it's mine. 
And hopefully, even if it's not your favorite movie, I've at least convinced you that it was better than you've heard, especially if all you knew about it was that it had a horrible trailer and then bombed at the box office. So whether you're someone who hated it the first time because the trailer implied it would be a completely different movie, or someone who never saw it or even heard of it before this video, or someone who'd watched it before and just generally didn't care for it, let me know whether I've changed your mind. Or even whether I didn't. I can't convince everyone. But I think Solaris at least deserves that you watch it with fresh eyes. Watch it with a friend and see what they think. Even if you both end up hating it. Well, I tried. That's okay. I'll like it enough for the both of us. The specifics of this movie, I don't think you can sell. I think that anybody who's been in love and or will die should see this movie. And that's pretty much everybody out there. That's most of the human race. <laughs>